Welcome back to our growing experiment. We're here with Amy from Restless Ravens. We spoke to Amy and Dan and uh, we spoke about their farm and what they're doing. And uh, we asked Amy to come back on the podcast just so we could chat about her apothecary. So Amy, before we get into that, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, just let anybody know um, a little bit about what you guys do for those who haven't heard our previous podcast and maybe give us an update on how things have been going and then we'll get into the apothecary. Uh, so we have a small homestead um, farm in West Nipissing in Field and we grow our own food, raise our own animals, we sell pork and eggs and poultry. Um, we also grow a wide variety of herbs and I make them into all different types of herbal medicine and I sell those and I also do um, subscription boxes so it's sort of like a CSA but it's with herbs and um, like herbal products and I do four of those a year for subscribers and we also do workshops and teach people about like foraging that type of thing um, and we just do a lot of like land-based skills and we want to be able to like share those types of things with other people and that's kind of what we've got going on. Okay, cool. And uh, anything new changed since we talked last? You guys doing anything new or changed any practices at all? Um, since we talked last, we um, so we've always raised chickens and like ate them for ourselves. But we started selling like the meat this year. That was newer for us. Um, and we were doing like combo type boxes because we normally just sell our pork, but instead we started selling pork and chicken together. Um, so that was new, um, like expanding with the herbs more. And then a goal that we're working towards now is expanding the farm. So we've built two new pastures and so we can get more pigs. And then we'd also maybe like to get some cows. And then we've also worked at, um, we want to build like a little farm store, um, apothecary, kind of like a farm stand, but to sell our products and then maybe some other local farmers in our community to be able to put stuff there. Um, just as a way to sell my products and other people's products, but um, it's easier for me to do instead of like doing markets or having people just randomly come here. Um, Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, doing markets now. It's gotten, I've been doing them for like five years, I think, now, and it's getting overwhelming because I just make so much stuff that, like, to bring everything is a lot of work <laughs> to set it all up and whatnot. So, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah, getting too big to run around like that. It's kind of when you're smaller, you're a little more agile. When you're getting bigger and you got more stuff to do, it's you have to move slower kind of in a way. So uh, you mentioned, Sorry. yeah, I was just going to say, you mentioned you might get more pigs. Would it be more of the Mangalitsa pigs or would you get different uh, breeds? Uh, the Mangalitsas, yes, expanding them more. Um, yeah. And then cows. Cows for dairy or for meat? Um, we would like to do both. Um, Mostly, yeah, we have interest in dairy because that's like one thing that we don't do ourselves and we eat lots of cheese and lots of milk and butter and that type of thing. I mean, obviously we wouldn't mm -hmm. be selling that type of product, but we would like to do cows to be able to sell beef as well. It would be nice. Well, that's cool. It sounds like you guys have uh, done a lot of expanding and a lot of thinking about expanding. So that's really good to hear. Sounds like you guys are doing pretty well. Well, excellent. So I guess uh, we'll start getting into the uh, the topic du jour there. Uh, so apothecary. Um, How did you get into it? Let's yeah. start with that. <laughs> um, well, we kind of, on the other interview, I kind of talked about like how my interest was peaked with herbs like as a child um, from like a neighbor who helped um, 
will help people in the community and helped her husband with his cancer and how that kind of piqued my interest with herbs. And um, as I got older, it's just kind of something that I started learning more about. And then obviously like everybody kind of knows people in their life that are maybe going through something and they've tried, you know, different prescriptions and different, all these different things and didn't have luck with them. And that's kind of what kind of pushed me more into herbs was to learn different ways to help people. And um, that kind of really kind of fueled that fire, I guess. And I just like being in nature and learning things. And so that's kind of what keeps that. And then, um, being able to like make products and sell things that are more natural, I think is important. And um, I just, I want to be able to provide medicine and herbs for people so that they can make their own medicine because I think that's really important when you're making the medicine yourself and because it gives it a lot more power. And I think it's something that people should be able to just know how to do and have access to. And I feel like a lot of people don't have access to um, like locally grown herbs and that sort of thing. So I want to be able to provide that for people. Okay. And so in, in that kind of line of thinking then, um, what, what do you kind of think is like a good like a uh, foundation for like, say the herbs that are good to have, or like your sort of your, your necessities, like your, your keystones. Well, I think plants that are native to where you live are a good way to start, you know, with what you have around you. And they're, so it's kind of hard to just like name certain plants because it's going to be different everywhere you go but i think a plant that's good for digestion something that's good for your immune function something that is good for your heart something that's good for your nerves like something that's going to cover every uh like component of the body um i think is important to have and there's so many plants and it could be different no matter where you are on the planet um and i think that's a really good foundation of plants to have is something that's you know that you can connect with and something that's in your area or that you're drawn to um and that you like that you like the taste of or you enjoy working with that calls to you um i think that's a good place to start and how about specifically to Northern Ontario? Are there some that you can name that would be uh, beneficial to have around? Um, well, some that I might name are not necessarily native, but have, have become like established and are more kind of like invasive plants. Mm -hmm. um, like one I can think of right away that would be handy for people is uh, mullein which is, it's not technically native to here, but it's become established. And it's a really good respiratory herb. It's going on right now with people. I think that that's a really good plant for people to kind of know what it looks like, how to use it. And some other ones I could think of, there's lots of good found. Um, obviously chaga is one people are familiar with, but there are some other ones that are less um, at risk of being over harvested like birch polypore is a good one and turkey tail um, we do have some reishi around is another good one um, for like immune function and um, it's an adaptogen so it helps your body handle stress um, cedar is a medicine that i really like it's a uh, really for when you get sick to make like a cedar tea. It helps give you vitamin C, it helps purify the air. You can take a cedar bath and that's really good for your muscles and for um, fungal type things. Um, yeah, those are some that would be around here that are native or invasive. And by harvesting invasive plants is good because you can help stop them from being invasive. 
Mm -hmm. And so, like, are these invasive plants, too, are they, like, invasive where they're sort of destroying the environment, too, or sort of out-competing uh, the, the native plant species? Um, I don't I wouldn't necessarily know the definition of invasive, but I think that's what kind of makes something invasive, right, is it's, it's taking over, okay. it's not native, and... Um, Obviously, anything that's taking over is taking over the habitat of something that else that would be there. So by harvesting invasive plants, eating them, working with them, um, it's a good way to, one, get the medicine, and two, help with the natural biodiversity um, so that it has a chance to, you know, fight off these invasive plants. Yeah, and that's kind of an interesting thing in a way, too, where you're trying to restore like a, a natural uh, balance in your body, and you're sort of doing a natural balancing in nature by helping out with this, say, invasive species, right? There's sort of a parallel there in your action. Yeah, and I also told by someone that um, plants usually present themselves um, when we need them. So sometimes when you see like a lot of invasive plants taking over, it's like a good way to pay attention to like what those plants have to offer because it's something that we need at that time. So like if we're seeing a lot of these plants pop up in certain areas, it's maybe because it has something to offer us that we need at that time. Well, and that's that's interesting because that parallels what you were saying earlier about that that particular invasive plant being good for respiratory issues, and then especially nowadays respiratory concerns being uh, sort of paramount. So, where did you learn a lot of this uh, knowledge that you have in regards to herb medicine? Um. So, I've read a lot of books. I still do read a lot of books. Um, and I've had different mentors and people in my life that I've either looked up to or worked with. Um, I've never taken a formal course. And I mean, I don't really believe in having to pay to get a title that, you know, says you, you can do this because, um, I believe you can you can do anything really if you set your mind to it if you want to do the work and research if you want to be with plants and actually like experience plants learn about them in all their cycles like that's more of a teacher than a course can be like there's some people that take courses and they have this you know degree or whatever that they did online and you go out in nature and you point out this plant and they don't they don't even know what it is but somebody who's been in nature and you know sat with the plants and talked to the plants and seen the plants in all the different seasons um and worked with them in all different kinds of ways um they build that relationship with them that you can't get from a you know a course or yeah. even a book really it's uh, experiences in nature is nature's my teacher <laughs> i guess is what i'm getting at Well, and when you think about especially how a lot of these plant medicines would have been used, uh, say, just a couple of generations ago by our grandparents and great-grandparents, great it was something that would have been passed down through generations and generations, especially it would have been passed down through women because women tended to be around the, the home and tended to tend to the plants and all that kind of stuff. But um, so really there was no official course or anything like that. It was It was a matter of having change your interaction with the environment and like you said learning from that yeah, yeah and, and from what i understand too like a lot of these plants uh that are fairly natural to a lot of areas can 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 do a lot of good too like i, I remember reading somewhere that uh during the civil war in the united states there was a, spe uh, a specific plant that they would harvest all the time because they would use it in treating wounds and it was like before they had, um, uh, what was it we used to, was penicillin. Before they had like penicillin and something like that, you would take this herb and you would sort of make a pumice out of it. 
and you would apply it to the wound and it would sort of keep off a lot of uh, infection and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Experiences and stuff like that are great teachers, I think. All right, um, and so thinking about uh, certain uh, medicines you would have natural, I'm thinking also uh, last time when we were trying to set up an interview, I think it was before uh, Dan had a toothache. And uh, so what would you say you used to treat a toothache? Um, well, what I was using at that time was, um, it's, it's a plant called toothache press. That's like the common name. And it has properties that make it so that it numbs the area it also helps kill bacteria um so you do have to be careful with it that you're not taking too much because it can if you swallow it it can disrupt like your gut bacteria and everything but if you're just applying it topically it it numbs it right away even if you take the plant and you chew a little bit of the leaf it numbs it um and then i was also using clove oil too you have to be a little bit more careful with essential oils because they are very volatile. Um, that's why I kind of prefer to stay away from them. So this was a tincture that I had made with the toothache grass plant and was applying that. He did end up having to eventually get the tooth pulled because like plants, they can't just cure everything. You know what I mean? Like they can, it helped him with his symptoms and, and lessened the pain and everything for him. but. Obviously, like you have to rely on doctors for certain things, like plants can't do everything for you. Um, but plants with, you know, modern medicine and doctors, um, if we could connect those two more, I think that the world would be a way better place instead of separating it so much. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you explained it that way, right? Because um, it's fine to think like, oh, I'm going to take a natural remedy and, uh, you know, it's all good for me. But you said there are certain risks associated to that. So when people are going to take these uh, natural remedies, um, do they know that, like, uh, how do they know about the risks in taking them? Is it on your tinctures? Is it something that they can uh, find information on uh, readily available? Um, so I, if there's something where there is any type of risk, um, I, on my website, I go really into depth on stuff like that, especially in my, um, subscription boxes. I do, I don't just give the products to people. I spend like a great deal of time doing like an extensive write up on each product. And then I also like how to use it. Um, and then different um, interactions it can have because some plants are so powerful that like they can have interactions with medications. Um, there can be risks if you're pregnant um, or nursing um, and that sort of thing. So I like to really go over those in case. Um, like some, for example, St. John's wort is a really powerful antidepressant and it's so powerful that if you are taking um, like SSRIs and like mood type drugs that it can interact with them and make it so that they don't work or give you the opposite effect, which obviously like somebody might be attracted to St. John's work because they have like depression issues, but they might already be on these medications. So that is something that they should look into because plants are powerful and yes, plants are safe, but um, they, they can also come with different, um, you know, risks, maybe not as scary of risks as um, some drugs, but you, it is something that has power and you have to respect that power. Um, and another thing that St. John's Word also can do is um, if you are on birth control, it can make it so the birth control doesn't work. <laughs> Um, so there is like different things like that, that you have to be conscious of, like plants do have power, they're, they are uh, like mm -hmm. safe, yes, but they do, they can have like risks as well, and, um, they need to be respected, and obviously like there's plants that are poisonous, and, um, a lot of like homeopathy type things works with, um, a lot of like poisonous plants in small doses, 
um, that's something I've not dabbled in because um, I just have a respect for that. It's not something that I've you know crossed into. I have an interest in it, but I like to stick with like herbs that I know are like generally safe herbs. Um, and that's kind of where I'm comfortable and where I'm at in my path. Yeah, well, it makes sense to stick with what you know. And, and uh, that's that's interesting that you mentioned those sort of uh, uh, those other effects that that St. John's wort has, because it's like, you know, you have your intended usage for it. And then there's also a couple of other things it's going to do. But that's that's even the same thing that happens with any other sort of prescription drug, too, where like uh, the common on label usage will be one thing. And then it'll be commonly used also for another thing that's an off-label usage. And so, I mean, and, and from what I understand too, like most of our uh, our modern pharmacology, like it is like synthesized, but it's plant derivative in a sense, right? Like it at, at the beginning in some sense came from a plant and they figured out how to synthesize it or take components from somewhere. Or, or could you speak to that at all? Uh, yeah, we kind of talked, I think, about that a little bit last time. Um about how like some common drugs today were kind of copied or first discovered from a plant and then they basically you know change like a certain molecule or something and then they're able to patent it and mm -hmm. make money off of it and um that's how a lot of things have came to be is from plants then there is some bad to it because it's been, you know, it's kind of like exploiting the plant, taking advantage of it and turning it into a money maker and then making people buy it when it's like something that's readily available to them. Um, but there is some good with it, I guess, in a way that they are helping people. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of that out there that you can see. Um, like last time I was talking to aspirin, like how all plants in the willow family contain the chemical that is in how they develop aspirin. And um, yeah, it's it's neat when you start learning about things. It, it makes you mad a little bit when you're like, well, they just copied that. And now people buy that and it's actually just everywhere. But that's kind of the world that mm -hmm. we live in. Well, the nice thing is, though, is like a person like you say, who sets out to want to learn some of that stuff, you find out that, well, actually, no, yeah, we, we have a lot of the things that we need right here. It's it's like uh, you just have to look in the right place. You just need that little bit of knowledge. It, it makes me think like, you know, if you if you really want to find something or you want to know the answer to something, you'll find probably an answer. Good answer, bad answer, workable answer. You don't know until you look for it. but like you say right there, there's an example of something that you could use. Yeah, and and that's kind of, I guess, one reason why I went like the plant path is just that to be able to have like this knowledge um, and to be able to help people in a way that doesn't cost them money. Like, I even though I know I make herbal products and I sell them to people, I would that's why I want to like have a store and be able to um, do workshops and stuff more because I find it more fulfilling to be able to teach people about the plants because I want people to be able to learn to do this themselves and to identify plants and to help themselves. And, you know, I would like to be able to grow herbs that people can access because I understand that not everybody has the means to like go out and forage things or to grow things. And if I could be that person to provide them with the plants and then when they need something, they could come to me and, and get certain herbs and stuff, um, but they could make the medicine themselves. Like, I feel like it's like cooking, right? Like everybody should have this skill. Like they might not have the ingredients at their fingertips, but I think everybody should have the skill to be able to make an infusion or to make a salve or to make something that they need when they need it instead of going to a drugstore and finding that the shelf is empty and your child is, you know, sick and you don't know what to do and you're like this helpless person relying on somebody else and they're not there to help you. Um, it's just, yeah, I, 
I want people to be able to do it themselves. I, I think that's really important. Yeah, and I think that's something we had started to think about more recently. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to reach out to you to talk about this topic, because you are seeing the shelves empty right now. But we were kind of thinking, you know, we want to be more self-reliant. Well, maybe that's a piece of it is looking into what options we have for when we do have certain ailments. So. Yeah, like, um, cause it, like, like you're saying, it, it we we do have the space to kind of grow some stuff. So, like, there's a few things you can kind of grow around the house. It just makes sense to do if there isn't something that's just nearby in the bush, because that's another thing too. And also, I kind of think it provides a secondary function, which you alluded to earlier too, as well. You mentioned you love being in nature, and that also kind of has its own restorative effect as well, right? Like going out, taking like kind of uh, slowing down a little bit, walking around, paying very close attention to your environment. Because that's a thing that on a regular modern person's day, they are usually going to a familiar place, like say going to work and coming back home. And because the places they go are so familiar, they're just seeing rough sort of intimations of what their environment is. They're not looking at it in detail. And then the way that you're talking about this wild, uh, like going out in the wild and uh, finding stuff, you're paying very close attention to your detail. You're, you're uh, much more immersed in your environment, and that's going to have an effect, as well as you're out there, say, looking for a particular medicine because you have whatever it is you have, and you're, you're going out there and you're providing that. And then, like you said, too, you have the, uh, you're also more independent now. When, when things do go bad, like we're, we're so fortunate that for so long, at least the whole time I've been alive, anytime you needed anything like medicine wise or whatever, any kind of drug, cough syrup, whatever it was, store always had it. You never even thought about it. You wouldn't even second guess it. And nowadays, right? For the first time in like a generation, it's like, well, you can't, you can't rely on that. And so you have to be, like you're saying, independent. You have to have this knowledge because it's, it's, it's actually a, a privilege to not be uh, informed, like to be ignorant in, in some way. Like, and, and it's, well, where the, that privilege is kind of running out, it looks like, right? Where it's like, well, maybe you should know what's around you in your immediate environment. What can you make use of? What can you do? Because if you rely on someone always to take care of you and that person's not there, in this case, the, the pharmacy or whatever, not having the drug you need, because your kid's not doing well, well, then who do you turn to? You just, you throw your hands up in the sky and you, you that's all you can do. Yeah, and, and when you are like uh, being more observant of things around you and actively participating in your ecosystem and not actually like abusing it and being more a part of it, you start to learn like, you know, like I was saying before, like certain medicines are there when we need them at certain times of year. Um, you learn about like, okay, this is invasive. It's okay for me to harvest lots of this. So this is endangered. Maybe I shouldn't harvest this. Um, and you, I don't know, you become a part of the ecosystem. And I think that's beneficial too, not just to yourself, but to the world around you. Um, rather than just going by your daily life and not not being observant of those things and, and what i was kind of thinking about too is like um like it, it's very clear when you're talking about this that you have like a very deep connection with like this it to me it comes across very much a way of life right like it's like you're, you're embodying a very certain uh kind of archetype in a way and like you're 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 into like taking care of yourself on like every level that way. And I, I, I feel like too, that's, that's in part like, a, like I think maybe we're going to hopefully see some more of that. It's like, um, it, like, again, it's like, the, it feels like people are very dis, like detached from the world and the reality and stuff like that. And the way you're talking about it, it like what I'm struck by is like, it sounds very fulfilling when you're talking about what you're doing. Like you're like that embodying thing. I'm having trouble finding the words for it, but I mean like being fully in that thing. 
And like, I, I get the sense that like, that, that is a, of an immense value to you. And I feel like that's one of those things too, that people on some level are looking for, but it's hard to articulate what it is, but it's like, that's, that's part of it. Like really being, being involved with what you're doing. I think it's because that's how we're meant to live. <laughs> like we're not meant to live in like boxes and go to stores and drive around and go to this job and do this and do that and take this drug and, you know, buy this new shirt and throw this out and do that. Like we're meant to, we're a part of something bigger, but at the same time, we're just one little piece part of it. Like we're not any more important than a bug crawling around on the ground, but um, we're a part of that, you know, like we, I think we all crave that connection to one another and to the planet and there's a reason why, like, you know, certain plants are needed at a certain time and there's these cycles and, like, it's not a coincidence that, like, certain things grow at a certain time of year. Like, the uh, roots that you need to detox your body in the spring and the things that you need to nourish your body in the winter. Like, it's not, it's not by mistake or... Um, you know, like chance that this all happened the way it did. Like it, it's, it's for a reason. And I think that's why there is so much like craziness in the world and depression and just people are so lost is because we're getting so far away. Some people are getting so far away from that connection and like social media and stuff like that gives us this sense of like being connected to people. And, you, you know, you got all this stuff at your fingertips. You can call somebody on the other side of the earth and do this and that. And you feel connected, but you, you're getting farther away, really, from each other and that real connection. And that's making us sick, too. And um, that's the other reason why I want to do my store is because I want... I enjoy posting on social media and like learning with other people and connecting with other people, but I want real connection. Like I want real community. I want people when they're sick to come to my store and say like, look, I have this going on. I, I need help. I need, I want to know about this plant. I, like, is there something you can do for me? Um, I want people to get, I want to meditate with people. I want to share feelings. Like I want real community um, like what people used to have like a long time ago. And I think that this is going to be the start of the action of that. Like I want, I want to connect people with their local farmers. I want that real connection, like a social media, but in real life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, uh, like to me, it's like, I I'm hearing a lot of like, uh, like, and even talking about nature, what it does, like you're talking about, like when the plants grow, when you need them and stuff. Uh, it makes me think of like the, the myth of like mother earth. Right. And it's just like, when you think about like uh, a human, right. When they have their kid first, like, you know, they get pregnant and the, the child totally subsists off the mother's body. So the mother provides everything the child needs. And then after when the child is born, the mother still again provides with her body, everything the child needs. And it's almost like earth in a way, right? Being like our mother, say as humans, knows what we need when we need it, just like our our human mothers know what we need when we need it, right? And like in that same way too, like I'm kind of hearing like um like you have it's it's like that you're like you you wanna like nourish people, like you wanna help take care of people. And and like part of it is like through this sort of nurturing nature kind of thing. Like it's like that's that's what I'm kind of getting a lot of. Yeah, and even just uh, in regards to her goal, it makes me think of when my family talks about, because they come from a small little village in Portugal, and they had a go-to person when they needed things in regards to, you know, ailments and everything. So it sounds like you want to kind of take on that role like people would in previous generations where, you know, like, oh, I'm ill, I'm going to go see Amy and see if she has anything that uh, that can help me, and it's like you said, right? It's it's not to replace a doctor because they have their spots, and you know um, you need to go see them for certain things as well. But 
us, we like to go a more natural route. So that's why we're interested in being able to access certain things that you can provide, right? And that's why we want to see what can we grow ourselves and help ourselves. Yeah. And and like that that part of the community part that you were talking about too, it's like that's a person you look to and you can count on, which is an essential part of like being community, right? It's like that mutual need of each other and the recognition of that mutual need of each other, right? And that's kind of what the community is built on. Like, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that totally makes sense that we should know. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a cool thing too, that I think like, um, that it is, I, I kind of look at it as being a feminine thing in a way it's a nurturing thing. And I, it's so cool to see that there's like a lot of women that really spearhead this space and are getting involved with that. Like, I just, I feel like it's like, uh, it's like uh, embodying that full archetype, like kind of being like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a cool thing. And it like, I, I kind of look at it as being like in line with like, uh, acting out like a nature thing, right? It's like the, the same parallel with mother nature and what mother nature does, right? It's also like sort of um, like woman is a, is a sort of mother nature on a smaller scale kind of thing or a reflection of that. Right. And it's cool to see that kind of, archetyped out that way so i was wondering how are all herbs prepared the same way like are you dehydrating them like uh what what goes into using an herb or a plant into a medicine uh well so a lot of the stuff i grow i do dry um so i dehydrate them or i dry them naturally um just like with time and um, some stuff I use fresh. Um, some stuff I infuse like into an oil, or I make soap, or I tincture it, or I extract it with like uh, glycerin or vinegar. There really is a lot of different ways you can eat them. Um, and I mean, a lot of the stuff I do and sell is like shelf stable products because that's just kind of the nature of what I'm doing right now. Um, and that's another reason why I want the store is because I want to be able to have like fresh herbs for somebody needs something. And sometimes certain things are better in their fresh state. And it would be cool if like people could come and like harvest it right away when they need it. Um, or go and dig up a root when they need it, or at a certain time period um, when that medicine might be stronger instead of like when I'm harvesting it, it's because that's when I have the time and everything to do it um, rather than, you know, doing it in energetically speaking, like with the time that correlates with what they need it for. Um, so whether that's going with, you know, astrology and stuff speaking, because um, certain days of the week can correspond with different parts of the body and moon cycles, right? So when you harvest these medicines at certain time periods, it makes it more powerful. And then also your intentions too, right? So if somebody's holding intentions to harvest a medicine with a certain purpose, it's going to give it more power to that purpose. So that's another reason why I'd like to have the store because right now my stuff is mostly dried and in different forms that are shelf stable because that's just how I'm distributing everything. Yeah. So like, um, you're talking about like the purpose and the, and the, so like you would probably even think like your, your moon phase and that kind of thing too, right? Like if you have a waning moon versus a waxing moon, and I guess even the stage of the development of the plant as it pertains to whatever the ailment you're trying to cure is and that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, with the uh, with the days, because the days correspond to certain planets, is, is the idea that um, there's more of the particular essence of that planet in that plant that day? So... The plants are also ruled by planets. So when you harvest the plants on the days that correspond with that planet, it can have more power. And then obviously if that plant, if you're seeking it for a certain ailment, 
you might want to harvest it on a day that is associated with that part of the body, um, which might not necessarily be what rules that plant, but it will help give power to that. Um, yeah, so certain things like that can come in handy, obviously, like when you're harvesting things fresh and when the person is doing it themselves. And that's something I would like to be able to kind okay. of talk about too in workshops and stuff with people, like, because um, that's not something everybody really knows about. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then I'm even thinking too for like combinations, because like say how uh, a lot of medicines are probably made up from more than one plant, right? Then if say you have uh, a couple of plants that pertain to a particular planet, but they say have different lineups for the particular body part you're trying to affect, you can kind of offset maybe where you can get one planet on the day because it happens to overlap, right? And another planet that corresponds to the body part. And so then you kind of get Two birds with one stone, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. Would, would that be a consideration, too? And then, like, let's say, too, if um, if you're going to harvest a herb, what would take precedent? Would it be more powerful to harvest the plant on its particular day, or would it be more powerful to harvest the plant in accordance with the particular part? Well... I'm a big believer in intention. So before anything, what your intentions are um, rules over anything. Um, so if you go into, like you could go into it and do your correspondence with like the organ and the day, but if you don't um, set your intentions beforehand or give your thanks and ask permission, that just all goes out the window. So for me, setting intention and having respect for the plant um, is, it, is the most important thing and the ruler of everything first. Okay. So then, so you've got your intention set out. You know what you're out there to do. You're ready to give thanks. Uh, and when you give thanks, are you going to leave an offering of any kind? Like I know traditionally in some cultures, they'd leave a little piece of tobacco or something like that. Or will you say maybe do a, a prayer or something like that? Um, I think you should do whatever you feel called to do and what you feel is appropriate and isn't going to, you know, hurt anyone in any type of group. Um Sometimes I will leave like an offering if that's what I have and what feels right at the time. Um, sometimes I will just say thank you, whether it's out loud or in my head. Sometimes I'll sing a song or say a prayer. One thing that I like to do um, that I teach people in my foraging course that I feel like is a, it's a good um way to feel kind of more connected and to it's more you're more conscious about what you're doing is i will rip out a hair from my head and i will give that as an offering because it's the same as like if you're ripping something off of a plant and you need that and they need that and you feel that and they feel that um it's like you wouldn't just, you know, if you harvested all these flowers and stuff and you didn't do something like that, you might not notice the damage you're doing. But when you're like ripping hair from your head every time, you're like, okay, that hurts. That's enough, you know? So that's one thing I like to do. Some mm -hmm. people think it's kind of weird, <laughs> but I think <laughs> it's special and it's intimate with the plant to do something like that. Um, yeah. I think you should do whatever feels right to you. There's no right way or wrong way to do it, but yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it, it definitely, there's a lot of different traditions and ways to do it, and I think people are sort of called to it. Like, uh, I don't know, like when you when you first started getting into uh, like apothecary and harvesting and stuff like that, was this something that was like an early thing in your practice that you started from the beginning or is this something that you learned and incorporated as you went on or was it inspired by a mentor or? 
Um, I, like any person, was ignorant to doing that. Like, I, I didn't know that I should be doing that. And I think most people are like that because um, that's how our society kind of is. Like, we're used to just being able to do whatever we want. And, like, things are at our fingertips. And especially, like, when it comes to nature, I feel like we've kind of like as a society looked at it as like it's ours to do what we want with and like it doesn't have feelings sort of and so at first I would say I was a little bit ignorant to doing you know asking permission and saying thank you and it was yeah definitely something that was taught to me and then something that I adopted in my practice and of course even just there's times where before it was taught to me, we're like, you stumble on something, you're so thankful that it's just in you to say thank you. Um, but yeah, it's something that I was taught and adopted and now it's something that's just second nature. Yeah, well, and I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those like sort of all encompassing values too, right? Just that gratitude. And and I think you're right, too, to point out, and I think that's something maybe we're coming to grips with as a society, that we have been abusive of, of the planet in, in a lot of ways or exploitive, right? And, and not thinking about um, how we replenish what we take. And so I guess a good example of that would be, like, say, our soil and how a lot of our topsoil is basically turning to dust right before our eyes. And part of that is because we're pumping a bunch of these sort of chemicals, which are essentially petroleum based into the soil. And we're not putting any living organic matter in there on top of the fact that we're spraying chemicals that kill everything on top of it. And then killing every other animal that lives in the field. So it doesn't take any of the plant. Like it's, it's a whole lot of death to create life and it's an imbalance. Like, I mean, obviously death and life go hand in hand and they are part of a balancing act, but it's, there's there's something is way out of balance there. I mean, I mean it just it seems that way. Like when you look at what's going on in the world around us, or or how we're looking at uh, what our potential future is, we're looking at like you know how much longer are we going to be able to harvest in the way that we harvest, and what happens if we can't do that anymore? So because we didn't have that gratitude, because we had that ignorance, because we looked at Mother Nature as if it was. Um, something we just take from for forever and ever we're kind of in a in a bad spot yeah yeah well that doesn't sound like a good note to end on but <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i guess even if it is sort of a negative thing to say in a way it's also maybe a look at reality right it's learning how to take on better practices that have gratitude sort of like how amy outlined right mm -hmm. uh be conscious of what you take and be conscious to give back, be conscious to say thank you. That what you mentioned about having the, the intention behind your action, right? Yeah. And really taking consideration too. Because for a lot of people, if say they don't like the idea of thinking about a planet and this and that when they're going to go harvest something, I think at least what has to be appreciated is that you're taking a, a high level of care with every action that you do. Every action is very deliberate. And so every sort of thing that follows from that action is much more sort of in your control because you've, you've taken the special care to be conscious of what it is you're doing. And that's kind of the best thing you can do is being an acting being in this world is be conscious of what you do. So if I want to try to put a silver lining around that cloud, hopefully that is. Well, and I also think... Um, weird as it is, if it wasn't for the ignorance of so many people and like the way that a lot of the earth is living, like people maybe wouldn't like have woken up as much as they have now to like being open to change. And like, I think we're seeing a lot of change. And so it's kind of bred like a new world in a way like people are you know realizing that we need to start doing things differently like it'd be nice obviously if it never got to that point like people if we maybe stayed the way things were hundreds of years ago 
but here we are, you know, and it's, I think the greed and just the way things have gotten is really making people go the other direction, like more now than ever. You know, like I, even just mm -hmm. lately, I've had so many people reaching out to me, like, because they're sick and they can't get medicine and stuff. And I'm like, well, do you have this going in your yard? Like, we've been lucky that we haven't really had a lot of snow. So I'm like, go dig around. There's probably this, you know, and all of these mm -hmm. scary problems that we're having is pushing people in a better direction. As sad as it is to, you know, have some of the consequences of this stuff happening um it's pushing people where they need to go and if we didn't have those bad things happening people would have ever got there and i think we're getting there and i think that's a good thing well it's good to hear that people are reaching out to you and trying to get some support that way because it's true like if you go to the pharmacy the shelves are empty so i mean if you do need something there are certain routes that you can take so it's good that people are reaching out and that you're able to help them that way yeah. now is uh when you're taking herb medicine is that something that you should always speak to somebody about before taking or do your research well i'm assuming yeah do your research <laughs> i think um if you are if you have any kind of health conditions you need to be careful or consult with your doctor first if you're pregnant or nursing um, but most herbs are safe. I mean, look into them or ask a herbalist for help when you want to work with these things. Um, but generally, like most things are safe. But obviously, when you are dealing with, you know, your own kind of health problems and stuff like that, or if it's a dire situation, like you need to be obviously responsible and careful, and not just diving into things as well as like plant identification is a whole other thing in its own. And could get you into trouble if you just kind of try and do that on your own. So it's always good to get, mm -hmm. you know, more than one person's advice on the topic. Yeah, more information is never a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. It was, uh, there was a lot to be learned there. There was a lot, uh, a lot more to consider too, when it comes to, uh, well, I don't, I don't know if you'd call it herbology. I mean, you call it apothecary. But her, is herbology close? Is that is that incorrect to say? I don't know if herbology is a myth. Herbology makes me think of Harry Potter. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> like, like, I feel like there's a different word for it. But, yeah, I think plants and learning about plants, yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you want to let people know where they can access your products and where they can reach you if they want to reach out? Um, so you can go to our website, which is restlessravens.ca, or you can find us on Facebook if you look up Restless Ravens Homestead. And we're on Instagram at Restless Ravens. And we're also doing a raffle right now for our farm store. So we have three different prizes. And you can buy tickets and win some herbal goods or some other couple prizes that we've connected with other locals. And the money for that goes towards building our farm store. And I'll purchase this store right now, get a free entry as well. <laughs> and there's free shipping over $150 right now. Is that what I had yes. seen? Yes, all orders over. There you go. <laughs> Um, qualify for free shipping as well as a thank you. Yeah. Well, perfect. Excellent. All right. Is there anything else you want to add in regards to your poth carrier or anything going on at the farm? Um, we're also offering this year, um, so our winter boxes will be going out at the end of December. And I'm also offering custom wellness boxes. You can go on our website and there is a link for that where you can put in your budget. You can put in if it's a gift or not and what type of things you're looking for help with. And I will cater the box to your needs with products that I make. And some of the products would be things that are not even listed on my website because I have a wide 
variety of herbs and I can make things on demand when I need to, custom to people's needs. Um, so that's because you would have the intention, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what we're offering this year. Um, and it makes great gifts too, really thoughtful gifts. Yeah, sounds good. All right, well, it was good to chat with you, and uh, thanks so much. Thank you, guys.